Welcome friends of the planet, Monica here. I hope you're having a great day. We have with us today a very special guest, Jason Bordoff, who is the founding director of Columbia University Center on Global Energy. They study economics, energy, climate, environment, and national security all together. So we're grateful to Jason for making time to talk with us today. Welcome, Jason. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Monica. It's great to be on. I'm a huge fan of our daily planet. Yes, thank you. You're a wonderful friend of the planet. So let's dive in. You've written a lot about climate change and foreign policy. And you really believe, as I do, that climate should be at the center of foreign policy for the U.S. going forward. Tell us a little bit more about that. And is it feasible in a world that's grappling with COVID and nuclear tensions and even shifting geopolitics that leaves multilateralism trying to find its way? It's a really good question. I mean, in, 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 even more opportunity and importance, but more challenges, as you say, given that we've had some challenges, particularly after the last administration, fostering multilateral cooperation and diplomacy and dialogue. And climate change is, is one of the most challenging issues to deal with in that regard. It, of course, is the most global of challenges. It doesn't matter where a ton of CO2 emissions comes from. They all contribute equally to the problem. And 85% of emissions come from outside the United States. So as important as it is to make much more progress, much more urgently here in the U.S., we're going to need the rest of the world to move forward and work with us. Re-entering the Paris Agreement on day one seems uh, obvious a step for the Biden administration to take. Having Secretary Kerry as the climate envoy, someone with his experience and stature and, and relationships at the head of state level is incredibly important to elevate ambition going into the next UN meeting in the Paris process in Glasgow roughly a, a year from now. But I think those are just sort of table stakes. I think then the question is how do you elevate climate change throughout many more aspects of US foreign policy, international economics, the trade agenda, even beyond ways that maybe has been done in the past in the Obama administration and elsewhere. And just a few examples, the trade agenda. I presume a Biden administration would have a return of engagement to some WTO norms. And in doing that, you would want to think about how to perhaps provide preferential treatment for lower carbon content products or expand the scope of permissible subsidies for clean energy. You would want to work with the European Union, which is talking about having carbon border adjustments and work collaboratively rather than be in conflict with them. We have a new, more powerful tool in the Development Finance Corporation, the successor to OPEC that allows the U.S. to use multilateral finance in new and different ways. And electricity is a critical development need. That half of development finance already goes to electricity access. So how do we use that as a tool to encourage cleaner development of energy resources around the world? Development assistance, technical assistance. It's good to elevate ambition for Glasgow, but most countries are falling short of their Paris agreements, nevertheless promising right. to do more. How do we help them get on the right road? And there are many other examples, but those are just a few where if you take a whole of government approach, you might be able to use more tools of national security, foreign policy, and international economics to be more ambitious on climate. I wanted to ask, in terms of global energy markets, what do you think that an incoming Biden administration, as well as a Democratic Congress, means for the future of oil and gas? Is this the beginning of the end or something in between? Well, it is obvious that this administration, and you just have to look at the transition website to see a button in the upper right corner called priorities, and there's only four <laughs> things there, and climate change is one of them, and the others are pretty important, like COVID and economic recovery and racial justice. So it gives you a sense of the level of urgency that they are placing on right. this issue. And I think you'll see that manifest itself in lots of ways that both encourage a faster transition toward lower carbon fuels, alternatives to oil, electrification of the vehicle fleet, and many more restrictions on how we produce oil and gas at home and the potential to continue to produce long-term going forward. The Biden administration and the campaign promised not to do new leasing, for example, on public lands for oil and gas. I do think it's important to remember that those are domestic actions. Obviously, it's a global oil market, which before the pandemic was about 100 million barrels a day. Most of that is used outside the United States. Most of that in the past, historically, the pace of oil demand growth has been largely driven by GDP growth and population growth. Of course, now we're starting to see alternatives coming into play as more and more countries put in place policy measures to encourage alternatives and lower carbon sources of fuel and the technology advances. So electric vehicles have come down in cost quite a bit. We shouldn't forget how staggering a challenge this is. I mean, think about this year as a test case. We put right. most of the planet at some point under lockdown, told people to stay home and shut down global economic activity, and oil demand this year will fall about 9%. Right. So mm -hmm. when you think about what it looks like to move to a world post-oil, and all the ways oil is used beyond just cars, which are around 20 or 25% of oil demand, trucks and ships and planes and industry, and in some places still you know, heat, a few places electricity, it requires a much stronger effort in terms of 
of policy, finance, and technology to continue to find alternatives that can move us toward a zero carbon future going forward. I do feel like we are turning a corner in terms of our resolve to actually meet it. And I think President-elect Biden deserves a lot of credit for having elevated climate in his campaign and talked so much about it and made that connection with jobs. You've written a lot about the idea that I know the president-elect latched onto during the campaign of capping orphan methane gas leaks and wells in the Rust Belt and in the West as a way to create jobs. What other opportunities might there be in this sector to do that kind of thing? And how realistic is that? Can it get it done? Yeah. And I think the point, just responding to what you just said, and then the question is really important. I was reminding people of the scale of this challenge, which we need to take seriously and realize how difficult it is. But there is a shift. I think you're right, Monica, not just in the US, but around the world. Companies countries, cities committing to net zero targets by 2050 or maybe a little bit later. We need to understand better what it means to take those targets seriously and really achieve them and how much work is needed to do that. But I think that reflects a rising sense of urgency about the problem. And that's because of the climate impacts we're already seeing every day. And there's clearly a shift in demographics where the younger generation in the US on both sides of the aisle, although they start from a different place, but the younger generation recognizes that this is a problem they're going to be uh, saddled with and, and the sense of urgency is much greater, which is what we need. The opportunity for for in a Biden administration to connect action on clean energy with economic recovery at home is important, not just as a political matter to build a coalition of environmentalists, racial justice advocates, the labor unions, but because it's, it, there's a lot of truth to it. And I think there are many things you can do. If we're serious about net zero by 2050, for the next 30 years, every week has to be infrastructure week. We have so much to build right. in terms of transmission lines, putting steel on the ground. As you said, some of those overlap with skill sets that people in the district dislocated industries like oil and gas have. And so I wrote a paper about what it would look like to cap orphan wells, these wells that have 100 years ago been abandoned and they're leaking pollution and government stimulus funds can be used to cap those and, and oil and gas workers know how to do that. They also know how to build large structures offshore and that might be offshore wind turbines rather than uh, an offshore drilling rig. They know how to build pipelines, which in the future might be used for hydrogen or CO2 if we're capturing it and storing it, but not just oil and gas. So I think there are skills in this industry that people can use and transition. We shouldn't diminish the impact of a transition and how hard that might be for certain dislocated communities. Policy needs to address that too as a matter of economic policy and justice, but there are many areas of overlap to the question you asked. Yeah, the justice aspect of it is really important too because those communities have suffered for a long time with the after effects of that pollution and that left leftover orphan industrial activity. And it would be great, really great to clean it up and create jobs at the same time. And just to be clear, we focused the paper on these legacy orphan wells, say from you know Pennsylvania over 100 years ago. The, the only risk with the proposal we put together is you want to make sure that ultimately the responsibility for this lies with the companies. Yes. And so if we're, government pays. is going to put its money toward it, we want to minimize that moral hazard problem. One way you can do that is focusing on the oldest wells for which the companies often are not around anymore anyway. But otherwise, it should be regulation that requires the industry to clean up their own mess. I wanted to ask, in terms of government coming together and acting on a bipartisan basis to enact smart climate and energy policies. What are your takeaways of the recent energy bill that passed? What are, what are the gaps? What are the opportunities? And what does this mean for an incoming Biden administration as they try to enact their bold climate and energy agenda? I'm glad you asked. It's quite important, actually. I mean, we saw just a few weeks ago, one of the most consequential pieces of legislation for climate in roughly a decade passed Congress, Huge. largely because it was the end of the year. And there's so much tragic turmoil in many other ways as this administration comes to an end um, for sure. that people are focused on. But but it was a really, it's certainly not sufficient to the scale of the challenge, but nonetheless, it was consequential. And it was a reminder that with hard work and a lot of groups involved in this, there are areas for bipartisan cooperation. I think now with Democrats holding a very narrow majority in the Senate, there are certainly going to be, whether it's through budget reconciliation or something else, tools they use, even if there's not bipartisan cooperation, because we just need to move really fast to deal with this with this crisis. But we saw there a major investment, about $40 billion in clean energy innovation and R&D. We put out a, a report, a roadmap a few months ago at the Center on Global Energy Policy called Energizing America, which laid out a path for what it would look like to go big on clean energy R&D and explained why that was so important. If you look at the estimates from the International Energy Agency for what it means to achieve net zero by 2050, fully half of the emission reductions between now and 2050 come from technologies that are not commercial 
commercially available yet. We can do a lot with renewables and batteries, but there are parts of the economy that are going to be hard to electrify and hard to decarbonize that way. And when you include carbon capture and advanced nuclear, you get more bipartisan support. Phase down of HFCs was probably the most consequential thing that happened from a Enormous. climate standpoint. Right. Um, that's very that's big. such a great great thing to have done. And it had been on the dais for a while and it just couldn't get through. And then the third piece um, was the tax extenders, the uh, efficiency vehicle, energy efficiency, vehicle charging, renewable energy tax credits. And when you combine all of those together, they really do make a difference. It's, a, those, it's an important piece of legislation. Those tax credits are appropriate, right? To make up for or to help boost that industry in its infancy. But I assume that that's not a distorting thing for the economics of it. Well, I mean, I think from the economics of it, you would say there's a economics 101 would say there's a negative externality created when we consume energy, which is the burning of fossil fuels puts pollution in the air that that harm all of us. And you want to internalize that ideally through a carbon price, which we haven't done. So by not internalizing that social cost, you're kind of leveling the playing field when you support lower carbon energy. And there's also a good argument to do that with early stage technologies that you're trying to get to a process of commercialization and deployment when they can scale. And we've seen that with solar and wind, I think. The investments that were made in the Recovery Act a decade ago are an important part of the reason why renewables are as cheap as they are today and solar is growing as quickly as it is, albeit we should remember still quite small as a share of the total. We have a lot of work to do, but the costs have just come down extraordinarily and for batteries as well. Can I follow up on one point you made, Jason, in that you mentioned that a lot of the reductions in emissions is going to come from technologies that aren't yet available, but how do we keep the focus as the Biden administration comes in on deploying resources or technologies that are already available and need to be deployed at scale? We need to be doing both, right? I mean, and that's why I thought it is important that the Biden administration has different goals. They have an economy goal by 2050, and they also have an electricity goal by 2035. And we can move faster in the electricity sector than in some other sectors. It is harder, more costly. We need some more tech work on technologies to decarbonize cement and steel and aluminum. But we have renewables, solar and wind and batteries, and you'll probably, I think you'll need to at a minimum retain existing zero carbon nuclear power. You'll need some baseload power, which may be gas with CCS or something, but we can do most of the work with renewables and batteries. So let's move on that really fast. That is here today. We know how to do that. And at the same time, be investing in the technologies, the commercialization, the demonstration and the deployment to drive down the cost of things like carbon capture or advanced nuclear or carbon removal or other technologies that the same way we did a decade ago for renewables. So we're in such a good place today to decarbonize the grid. A decade from now, we'll be in as good a place to start to decarbonize some of these sectors that are frankly a little bit harder. I think the change happened faster than anyone anticipated. So now we have to hope that that happens again. Last question for you is you're at Columbia University. I'm an alumna of Columbia University. Tell us about your new school for climate change. How important is that? And why did the university make this commitment, this huge commitment to educating the next generation on the issues surrounding climate change? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. And I'm, it's an incredibly exciting place to be right now, not just because I grew up in uh, in New York and, and, and knew I wanted to come back here after having the privilege of serving in the Obama administration. Columbia University is so incredibly strong in so many aspects of this, from the interdisciplinary sustainability research at the Earth Institute to the climate science that's done by my colleagues at Lamont Doherty to now the Center on Global Energy Policy, which I built uh, about eight years ago. And of course, you know, energy is responsible for 70% of emissions, so you don't have climate solutions without energy solutions. And the president of the university, Lee Bollinger, the new head of the Earth Institute, Alex Halliday, uh, the trustees of Columbia have, have announced that they've approved the first new school at Columbia in 30 years. And the goal is something on the scale of a law school, business school, medical school that creates new disciplines. A few decades from now, you will think about academic disciplines that don't exist today that are needed to deal with the study of both managing the impacts of and dealing with the solutions to climate change. The same way over 100 years ago, there were not schools of public health. And it's hard to imagine managing a crisis like COVID today without schools of public health. We needed to create create new areas of academic work that brought together all aspects of this from the science to the technical and the engineering to the policy, the law, the finance, and bring those together to train the next generation of leaders. And hopefully the school is really being designed from the outset with the idea that it's not only doing, it is doing academic work, but academic work focused on solutions and trying to build the capacity through different types of appointments, people with different backgrounds like myself. I, I was a policymaker and, and worked in think tanks before coming to Columbia, I'm not a career academic. And by combining people like that with one of the best tenured faculty in the world, you can really design solutions that policymakers and people in the private sector can pick up and put to work to uh, 
make more progress than, than we are. Fantastic. And I teach at Georgetown and so many of my students either want to study this or want to make their whole career about it. They're just so different than the kids were back in the day when we went to school. So it's wonderful that the university has recognized this. And though it may be the first, I'm sure it is not the last of these kinds of schools that will be created in the coming years. Yeah, there are a lot of universities doing pretty extraordinary work on this and we're going to need them all. And we're going to need, I mean, Columbia has 10 global centers around the world. We're going to need partnerships and cooperations with universities and other institutions around the world. Coming back to the point earlier about how this is a global problem. I want to have you put in a plug for your podcast. Tell us about that. Oh, well, that's Columbia Energy Exchange, and uh, it certainly couldn't hold a candle to the work you guys do. Yeah, we've been doing it about four years. It's a weekly 30, 40 minute conversation with a leader in the energy or climate uh, sector. And uh, hopefully people find it interesting, but at a minimum, it's a fascinating way for me to just reach out to brilliant, interesting people and learn a lot by talking to them. So uh, it's, it's a, a joy and selfish for me in that way. So uh, I personally love it. I always it learn so much, so I couldn't recommend it more. And we can include the link to that podcast down below. Thank Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. This was really informative and we really appreciate having you on and hope we can talk to you again in the future. Great. Good to talk to you. Thanks so much for the invitation.